Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, hello again. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening. I know you're going to get a lot out of today's talk. With me is Dr. Allison Applebaum. She is an associate attending psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And she's also the founding director of the Caregivers Clinic at Mo- <laughs> Memorial Sloan Kettering, the first program of its kind to provide comprehensive psychosocial care to family members and friends of patients who are in the caregiving role. Ah, that's a mouthful. So what are we going to talk about today, Dr. Applebaum? It is a mouthful. <laughs> you want well, to, uh, there's a lot, we, a lot we can cover for sure. <laughs> that is, that is true. I'm sure you have lots and lots of information, but we, we kind of landed on telling our loved ones stories and maintaining their personhood. So do you want to start a little bit more about your background and tell us about the book you wrote, which this topic is part of that book. Absolutely. So um, I'll start with the professional and then go into the personal because they were, they were both, they both, they co-occurred. <laughs> so I am a clinical psychologist by training. I came to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in 2010. And at that time I was working primarily with patients with life limiting cancers at the end of life. And what was so striking to me about that work, Jennifer, was that as opposed to their narratives focusing on their own mortality, they were focused on their parents and partners and children and siblings and friends, individuals left in the waiting room and left at home, the individuals who they identified as the linchpin of their care and who would be so deeply impacted by their eventual deaths. I realized at that time that cancer care specifically and healthcare more broadly was increasingly relying on family caregivers to shoulder tremendous responsibilities without any additional training or support. And despite the fact that the scientific literature at that time had already documented the profound emotional distress of caregivers, there were no support programs available for caregivers in any cancer center in this country. Mm, and so in that's surprising. Surprising, shocking, horrifying, all of the adjectives we can, you know, we can come up with. It's all those things. It was to me. And so a year later, I founded the Caregivers Clinic, whose mission is to assure that no caregiver experiencing significant distress as a result of their critical role goes unidentified and deprived of necessary psychosocial services. The clinic provides support to caregivers of patients with all sites and stages of cancer from diagnosis through bereavement. The clinic was the first of its kind. I'm happy to say I and colleagues are now in the process of disseminating and replicating this model of care. And it is my hope that in the next five to 10 years that every cancer center in this country will have this type of support. The same year that I founded the Caregivers Clinic, I stepped into the caregiving role for my father. My dad, Stan Applebaum, had Lewy body disease, which is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that leads to fluctuations in both autonomic functioning and consciousness. So for him, he would have sudden drops in blood pressure and temperature to near hypothermia levels, and he'd hallucinate. He'd hallucinate anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours, occasionally an entire day, and one point an entire week. Oh my so gosh. We had no idea. Yeah, it was terrifying. And we had no idea how long that they would last. What we did know is that he was not able to connect meaningfully with us when he was hallucinating. And I personally experienced each one of his periods of hallucinations as a mini death because I lost contact with him. Now, my dad's diagnosis of Lewy body disease actually happened when he was in a coma. He had been, I brought him to the hospital for treatment for a urinary tract infection, which is obviously common in older adults, a primary driver of ER visits. And my dad had delirium, which is a confused or altered mental state, also very common in older adults, and I should say very scary for us as caregivers to experience. Um, he was given an antipsychotic medication to treat the delirium. Uh, Oops. Neither my mother, who was at the time as healthcare proxy, nor I were consented. That's besides the point. The, the medicine put him into a coma. There was a silver lining because that actually gave his team of doctors a hint that he might have Lewy body disease. However, 
during that two week period when he was in that coma state, I learned the most important lesson in my caregiving journey. One that was reinforced during every one of the periods of my dad's hallucinations. And that is that without me by his side to serve as his eyes, his ears, and his voice, there was absolutely no way for any members of his healthcare team to have any idea who my dad was and what mattered to him. That it was my responsibility to share his story, to convey who he was as a human, not just as a patient, and to make it matter to those who were taking care of him so that they could truly care for him. That makes sense. I don't think we think about those things until we're thrust into that type of situation like you were thrust into. And I'm still a little gobsmacked over a hallucination that lasted over a week. Yeah, and I think, you know, certainly if you are, if, you know, listeners are in the situation of caring for someone with a neurodegenerative disease, uh, brain cancer, a cancer that has treatment that impacts the brain, any illness that has a neurocognitive component that this element of a responsibility may be more at the forefront earlier on, but I strongly believe it's a responsibility that every caregiver holds, that every caregiver in some fashion is asked to tell their care partner's story, to share who they are as humans, to share what their goals of care are, and equally, if not more importantly, what their goals of life are. Yep, that's important. Can we digress slightly? And Ooh. I'm gonna ask you, um, how did you learn to navigate his hallucinations? Because I know many of the listeners do deal with hallucinations. I hope not ones quite as long as you've just described. And it's it's very difficult to know what to do. And it's like after all these years of podcasting and the training that I do and all the stuff that I do, I have never had the opportunity to talk to somebody about, <clears throat> excuse me, dealing with hallucinations. And it's not something my mom experienced, I think she might've experienced it once. It was hard to know the difference between, did she think she was seeing a woman in the tree or was it just her terrible visual processing? She wasn't afraid or anything. It was just a random comment that there was a lady in a tree about 200 feet away. So how, how, how did you help him? How did you, you know, pr protect yourself might sound a little yeah, not yeah, yeah. quite right, but oh, you're, sure. you're following my train of thought. Yeah, I'm following. Um... It's important because these, these hallucinations like delirium can be very scary. So my dad had classic LBD hallucinations in which the characters would not speak to him. And unfortunately, you know, these hallucinations were not positively toned. Had he hallucinated being on a, on a beach in Hawaii, well, that would have been fantastic, right? Yeah. His hallucinations primarily were of the flavor of three men standing at the foot of his bed waiting to attack. So Ooh. unfortunately, he was terrified a lot of the time. And I'll tell you, and I, I, I write about this in, in my book, there was an experience, perhaps one of the most painful for me, where I came home from work one day and my dad was so angry at me. Now, my dad and I had the closest, warmest, most vulnerable relationship. And when I, when I asked why, I asked the home health aide who was with him because he was hallucinated at the time, why is he so angry? The aide shared that he had hallucinated me sitting at the edge of his bed silent the entire mm. And that was not something that I was capable of doing. And I found myself in that moment trying to repair a part of our relationship that was broken outside the context of my own lived reality. How did I cope? How did I help him? Number one was safety. Understandably, when he was hallucinating, it made it much more difficult for him to take his medications and to swallow safely and to eat safely. And so we were extra careful when he was hallucinating to watch him and to make sure um, that he was able to, you know, take in food, like was, was doing it safely. At the time my dad was bed bound, he was full assist. He needed help with all activities of daily living, but the hallucinations were really what made caregiving so difficult. Um, so number one was ensuring his safety. And number two was depersonalizing it. Which what I mean by that is realizing if my dad was angry at me, it truly had nothing to do with me, that he was experiencing something that I wasn't. And that was a lesson I had to learn. I think it's an important one for us to be able to create a little bit of emotional distance from an individual, from a care partner who's hallucinating because we aren't experiencing it and it can be very distressing for us. Um, 
And then number three, of course, and, you know, my dad had a disease characterized by hallucinations, but oftentimes hallucinations can be indicative of infection, dehydration. They can be a sign of another medical pro process underway. And so I would, you know, just encourage you all to take them very seriously. I, I, you know, over time got as accustomed as one can to hallucinating <laughs> and, and would understand, you know, when he, you know, when it was quote unquote safe for him to just stay at home versus when the hallucinations were a sign of um, him coming down with the UTI, for example. I don't know if that fully answers your question or not. Um, no, it's a very good start. Um, was there any way of reassuring you know kind of calming him or is that part of the disease it just you just had to ride ride it out with him you know i did a lot of calming him down i did a lot of so he was able to speak to me and he was able to connect in this sense he was aware that i was there but at the same time he would be seeing these three men for example you know with there's always they were always carrying a briefcase with some material and he was always scared and you know i, I was doing a lot of reassurance dad there's no one at the bed it's just me um, which got tiring, which got sad for me. Um, mm -hmm. I did a lot of that. And sometimes it would help for maybe a minute or two, but ultimately I felt quite powerless in the face of these hallucinations, unfortunately. It was the hardest, I should say the hardest, but one of the hardest parts of, of my journey. Yeah, I've, I've, the people that I've inadvertently had like secondary conversations, so like somebody's told me their story that just, there's not a lot you can do with hallucinations. So that's just, oof. I feel for you. That's, that's just terrible. I'm going to be, I'm just going to be a little shocked all day over. I did not know hallucinations could last that long. I thought they were, you know, not, not an entire day's worth. So less than 24 hours. So yeah. I'm yeah. still quite shocked, <clears throat> but I'm assuming that these, uh, the hallucinations made it extremely difficult. If one of these happened, and he had to, you know, deal with the medical profession. Like, how would, you know, that is that where telling his story and keeping his personhood? Exactly. Kind of exactly. So let me share, you know, um, just just very briefly, because I can't speak of my dad's personhood if I don't speak of my father. So my father, Stan Applebaum, um, was an incredibly prolific musician. He was an arranger, composer, orchestrator, and conductor who did many of the big arrangements for artists like Benny King and Neil Sedaka. My dad is best known for his arrangement of Benny King's Stand By Me. He mm. had his hand in every element of that piece, but what turned that piece of music to a piece of art is a string line in the middle of that piece, in the middle of the, the song, which sounds like a small symphony, and that was my dad's work. Um, my dad never wanted to stop growing and never wanted to stop learning. He was continuing to write music from his hospital bed. He chose at age 92, this was after his diagnosis of LBD, to learn Tagalog, the language of his home health aides, so that he could speak to them in their native language. This was a man who did not want to stop growing. The disease was complicated because when he wasn't hallucinating, and thank God there was more time when he wasn't than when he was, he retained a short-term memory, his long-term memory, his zest for life, his creativity, his drive to be musical and creative and enjoy life. And so what was so challenging is inevitably when I brought him to the hospital, 98% of the time he was hallucinating because the hallucinations would be triggered by infection, urinary tract infection, sepsis, dehydration, sleeplessness, all the reasons why we would bring an older adult. No, we wouldn't bring the older adult, let's be clear, to a hospital for sleeplessness. That's where you get it. Um, but, you know, for the reasons that we would go for, for treatment, that, that, that he would be hallucinating. And so members of the medical team, when they would meet my dad, would meet a frail 90-something-year-old man who was unable to connect with them. And I found myself defending my dad's personhood trying my best to convey to them that three days before this urinary tract infection started, he was commenting on Rachmaninoff, the, the composer we were listening to on the radio, and talking about how Rachmaninoff's string lines and the Applebaum string lines intersected in some creative way. <laughs> this was a man who was still oriented. And so I will share one of the tips I have in my book, and I can speak a little bit about the book, is whenever possible, and of course this was particularly helpful because of the nature of my dad's disease, I would often take videos of him that were time stamped, right? So you could take a video and say, this was May 16th of 2024. 
so that I could show the doctor that three days ago, this is where my dad was. Because often, quite frankly, I felt like they did not believe me. In fact, they probably did not believe me because of what they saw. And I was on the defensive. And what I found myself doing was trying to convince them that what they saw in front of them, again, a frail man, unable to communicate, 92 years old, 93, 94, 95, that wasn't his permanent lived reality. And that maybe a month ago he was walking down, yes, with a with a walker, but walking down the boardwalk in the New Jersey by the New Jersey shore. Um, and so that that felt that felt very um significant for me. Um the book I'm referencing that you mentioned, Stand By Me, a guide to navigating modern meaningful caregiving. And now you have insight into why the title is Stand By Me, because of course there's some deeper meaning to this book. This is a narrative nonfiction compilation of both my personal experience in caring for my father, as well as my 15 years as a caregiving scientist. My dad died in February of 2019. And when we went in down, went into lockdown, basically a year later, I faced my own unique existential distress on top of grief, which was still very, very, uh, very um, strong for me at that time. And that distress was a distress that here I was leading a clinical service, providing care to caregivers, facing an extraordinarily long wait list for care, six months, and realizing that even if we could meet all the needs of the family caregivers at MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, that there are so many of the 53 million caregivers out there who don't have any support, who have nope. no access to the type of support that I and my colleagues can provide. And so part of what I've tried to do in my book is to provide a Cliff Notes version, if you will, to the type of care you might receive should you come to the caregiver's clinic. I cover topics from how to navigate difficult emotions and sit with uncertainty, to healthcare communication and engaging in advanced care planning, to implementing home care and the Medicaid system, to coping with grief, and finding meaning and purpose in caregiving. And each chapter includes a lot of case examples from my, my personal, my professional experience, personal stories, and very importantly, a lot of support, guidance, instruction, and communication techniques that you can take with you that really were inspired in part by every one of the moments that I stood by my dad advocating for Stan Applebaum and doing my best to make sure that those who were caring for this person in the stretcher were caring for a human with a story. Is it common, because this is from coming from a non-medical person, is it, it's, a lot of times when you're having an emergency, it really feels like they're treating the causes or the symptoms or whatever. Thankfully, I've not had terribly, I've had one emergency in my life, so I don't have too much personal experience and my mom was really healthy other than the Alzheimer's. So my my experiences are pretty limited. But when you end up in the ER with, you know, like you said, the UTI or dehydration or whatever's causing the symptoms, is it normal for them to kind of focus on symptoms and not the person? I'm grateful that you asked that. Of course, the answer is yes, right? When you when you're initially brought in to an emergency room, of course, the goal is to treat the underlying driver of what's causing the problem. However, when you arrive at the emergency room, a treatment plan is determined in part based on, for example, a patient's goals of care. Have they do they have a do not resuscitate order or not? Do they have any goals of care documented anywhere or not? And those questions very much shape the medical care that's delivered. In fact, something I talk about in the book is that my dad had a very long, we had a very long dialogue, repeated dialogue about DNR status, do not resuscitate status. He chose to not complete a DNR order because we realized together and he realized ultimately that had he signed a DNR order, he actually would have never survived the coma in 2013 and gone on to have at least six and a half more years of life and realized that that, that really shaped, um, he wasn't resuscitated in 2013, but having that DNR order signed, it, it, it does shape the type of care and the urgency of care that's given. Um, and so, yes, you're absolutely right. Of course, top of mind is not who in the world is Stan Applebaum, it's <laughs> why is his blood pressure 60 over 10 and can we do anything about it, right? Um, but in order to actually implement care beyond that moment, 
there has to be some understanding of who that patient is. And that's why I say in those moments, maybe it's you, me, me in that moment was saying no DNR. Uh, my dad has not completed a DNR and he, he wants to still live. And just to be able to say that. Um, and then, then, you know, as soon as the immersion period is over to speak more often with the nurse, sometimes with the physician, the, the, the attending physician about what his goals are and how we can help to accomplish them. But again, I think there's even just small amounts of information that are quite critical. So on the topic of DNRs, I read an article some time back and you, you kind of hinted at it. When you have a do not resuscitate order specifically laid out the paperwork and all the legalities, it, it kind of colors the medical care team's view maybe not even consciously so they're like you know well if you don't want to be resuscitated they it's and that and i'm not saying this in a negative way but they take fewer steps towards trying to keep you alive or uh, it might not be exactly the right wording but is that yeah. kind of what you're saying a dnr can cause i mean yeah, it's obviously very clear but there's we're talking i think we're using let's say not causal but correlational like there's an association here and I want to be clear um, and preface this with this is my statements not coming from any research I've conducted or have read, but my own personal experience, which was when I, in that brief moment, stated my dad is not DNR, there was a greater sense of urgency in the response to the medical team that I imagine had I said my dad is DNR, well, they may not have taken him to the A1 resuscitation room in the emergency room where he, they weren't actually resuscitating him, but giving him fluids urgently and getting antibiotics in the IV, they may not have been as quick to do that if I said he's not DNR, right? And then also, by the way, it's not just DNR status. Um, there's many other directives. You know, I don't want to go to the hospital anymore, or I don't want IV antibiotics anymore, or, you know, there's lots of other decisions, but I, I will say anecdotally for us, my dad and I, and, and that was why he ultimately continued to choose to never sign one because he realized that, um, that he wouldn't have gotten the life-saving medical care that, that did allow him to have some really beautiful moments. And because he was not ready to go, his words. <laughs> it sounds almost more like it's not a callous handling of somebody it sounds almost more like um resource management mm -hmm. like why would you rush this person off to what you just described if they're that's not really what they want yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. we don't exactly have you know yeah. an overabundance of physicians and geriatricians and all that stuff so it does yeah. really sound a little well, bit more like resource management and again i'm not trying to make it sound like doctors are like oh eh, this guy's dnr just ignore it i'm not suggesting that at all so you've gotten past the emergency now you're advocating you're telling their story so how do you move from the initial emergency where you're still advocating a little bit for their personhood you know how how do we manage that because i think a lot of people some people come across as a little aggressive with that because of their lived experiences and some people you know wanting to be respectful you know this is the doctor they've gone to school you know, I'm lucky if I got out of junior college kind of deal. And they they don't advocate as passionately as they maybe should have. So how do you kind of balance yeah. all of that, all that thought process? Well, I think, you know, always first allowing space for members of the medical team to share what they, they want to share with you in terms of the plan of care. Um, but then actually maybe even asking the question, might it be okay with you if I told you a little bit about my dad, my partner, my child, my friend, my sibling, because I think it's important for you to know when we come up with this plan of care. You know, for I, I'm thinking back to a time when they were deciding between my dad had my dad had repeated urinary tract infections. He had a super pubic catheter that oftentimes, you know, would bacteria would 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 get in there and 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 lead to pretty significant. Um, one time sepsis and significant infection. And at one point we were, he was hospitalized because we were, you know, we were hospitalized because it's always we, we, you know, he was hospitalized and the attending physician was determining whether he would get one antibiotic, which would, I think be a five day course in the hospital. And then he would go home on oral or a 14 day course of IV antibiotics. And that was a moment when my sharing my dad's goals of life and what's important to him 
was really critical for me to share with that doctor because spending two weeks in the hospital, which is of course more time for my dad to become deconditioned, to get a hospital acquired infection, God knows what else is gonna happen. You know, that, that wasn't in line with his goals of care. Um, and so it was important for that physician to know that. So I think that's where taking the time to, to really share the story. And I'll also say what can be really helpful is figuring out who on that team is going to be your champion. It might not be the attending physician. The attending physician is the person who directs all the care. Mm -hmm. It might be the resident physician or the fellow. So it's attending at the top of the hierarchy, then the fellow, then the resident, and then the intern. And then below the intern is a medical student. And then, of course, there's a nurse. It might be the nurse. It might be the resident or fellow. It's usually not the attending. But I, I would say, figure out who's going to be your champion. And by champion, who's going to who's going to take the time to speak with you, to get to know your care partner, get to know their story, and get to know who they are through you. And I think that can be really, really helpful in helping to make sure that that story is known. And it's really taken into account when treatment plans are developed. Do you have any tips on how to maybe pinpoint that person other than chasing them all down the hall and having conversations that they don't necessarily sure, have sure, time sure, for? Sure. Well, I think, you know, reflecting back on my own experience, often it happened organically. And what I mean by that is often naturally there would be one member of the team who would say, here's my cell phone, call me if you need it, or here's my, this is how you get me, or who would maybe be less rushed with me. Often it was the nurse. Often it was the resident who is not directing the care, but implementing the care. And I think you'll just know who is that person. And if, you are figuring out organically who it is. I encourage you to, to say to the nurse, because the nurse is always, our nurses are, are, are so, so psychosocially minded. I would say to a nurse who's associated with the care team, I would really like to be able to speak with somebody about my dad's goals of care, who he is, and just the goal of how care is being developed, how the treatment plan is being developed. Who is the best for, person for me to speak to? Is it you? Because I'd love to talk to you. You know, I really, you could even just ask the nurse, but, but often, at least for me, I found it was organic and that one of those team members would just sort of self-identify as my, as my go-to. Because of course, in my little silly brain, I'm thinking, you know, all the TV doctors, there's always that one that pauses for a moment to get the rest of the story, which hopefully is more realistic than it probably is. But the only time I was um, in the, in the hospital with my mom, she was, she fell and broke her leg, was literally at the start of COVID. She broke her leg on March 8th, 2020. She went back to the care home on March 12th. Does anybody who has any memories left knows that that was the time when we went from, oh, this is a thing happening in China to, wow, what's going on at nursing homes in Washington state to, holy heck, now we have to stay home? <laughs> it's just, it, it was insane. So nobody talked to me. <laughs> it was, nobody gave me phone numbers. It was. It was not a fun time a at all. The, the initial period of lockdown was, was a yeah. uniquely challenging time just to acknowledge that piece, of course. Yeah, no, it was definitely it was definitely not the not the uh the typical <laughs> hospital, yeah. I'm sure. Um, but it was, you know, and when my dad was in the hospital in 2016 into 2017, most well, I guess it was all 2016 we were dealing with his personal nephrologist kidney doctor for those who don't speak that language and um one of the nurses on that floor was actually a past client of mine so they already kind of knew the story and so i have not experienced what you're what we're talking about here today so that's kind of you know helpful and you know of course it's it's hard to get that mental picture of that tv doctor out of your head we think that's how it works but you know, we don't we don't cure everything in 55 minutes or 45 minutes, unfortunately. So once you've found this person that has the time and the that I don't want to say, well, they have the empathy to listen and help, help let it help them help let the information guide them. I like the way you said, may I share with you because that's that's showing respect, even just respect to their time, because we all know everybody's super, super busy. Awesome. Um, how else did you go about it? Did you know how, like, do you yeah, have a little bit of a ro roadmap? I'm sure you do since you wrote a whole book. 
Well, as I shared, I, I did do a lot of showing of pictures and videos, um, being able to open my phone and say, look, this was just two days ago, or this was yesterday. Um, that was incredibly helpful. I encourage you to use your phone for that purpose, um, to be able to help to share their story. Um, you know, but it really was a matter of making sure that what my dad had articulated to me as his goals of care, that I was able to convey those to the nurse or the other members of the team. Um, you know, that what that brings up, of course, is that my dad and I had had conversations about his goals of care. And so that brings up another domain, which is to say that, you know, in order to know what your care partner wants, you actually need to talk to them about it. So I would just also say, as a, in addition to equally importantly, talking to a nurse or a, the person you identify as your advocate on the healthcare team, it's it's so critical that you have conversations with your care partner about their goals of care, about what's important to them. And how do you recommend a caregiver, you know, maybe somebody like myself, the adult child, approach these conversations when they're reluctant. So most of my listeners know my dad was diabetic. He had a donated kidney that was failing and he just assumed my mom would come live with me. We never had conversations. I did know that he did not want to go back on dialysis, which his nephrologist also knew, but she seemed to ignore that. That's a whole other podcast, <laughs> but I just, I could not get him to talk to me about what he wanted, you know, why the hell we didn't talk about what would happen if he died first? What would happen with mom? You know, yeah. it's like hindsight is real good, but it's not very helpful. Sure. So one thing I've done throughout the book is actually included very concrete communication strategies that you can use to help navigate difficult conversations. And the fifth chapter actually focuses explicitly on advanced care planning discussions. I'm going to give you um, a tool that I talk about in the book that can help you to open a conversation, whether it's difficult because you as a caregiver find it overwhelming, which by the way, it is because of course, opening a conversation about advanced care planning invites an elephant in the room and that elephant is death. Mm -hmm. No one wants to talk about death. Um, or it's difficult because your care partner doesn't want to talk about it. They're resistant to it. The technique's called setting the agenda. And setting the agenda is something that we can practice in advance of the actual conversation that we have. When you set the agenda, you tell your care partner what it is you wanna talk about and why. So I'll give you an example with my dad. Setting the agenda might've sounded something like this. Dad, I would really like to talk to you about what type of care you would like to receive if we can no longer control the symptoms of your Lewy body disease. I need to know what you want in case there's a time that you actually can't communicate. Would that be okay? Now, the reason I say you can practice it is what I just said to you, I have practiced again and again. You can practice it out loud to the wall, to a therapist, to your friend, to your dog, <laughs> practice, right? And so, and then you say it. Now, your, part, your care partner would say, I don't wanna talk about this, in which case you'll say, okay, I'm going to ask you again, because there's no way that I can take care of you without this information. And I also want to emphasize that even if your care partner, like my father, was open to talking about it, he wanted to talk about his goals of care, he made my job easier. This is a conversation you're not having once or twice. This is a conversation you're going to have repeatedly because goals of care change, right? When my dad wanted for his care in 2013, the year he was diagnosed with Lewy body disease, that was different from the year he died in 2019. And had I not had repeated, honest, open, vulnerable conversations with him, there would have been no way for me to understand what he wanted and to accurately bring his voice into the room. And so setting the agenda can be really helpful. You know what else is really helpful? It's, it's very simple. But to me, it's basically the most powerful stress management techniques for us as caregivers. And that is a deep diaphragmatic breath. Mm -hmm. A deep diaphragmatic breath is you taking a very deep breath in through your nose. You're going to hold it for three seconds. I can't talk and hold my breath at the same time. <laughs> Imagine it. And then you exhale slowly through your mouth. And you do that because when you breathe in through your nose, you get more oxygen into your brain. And that oxygen lowers your stress hormone cortisol. It lowers your stress. So I suggest to all the caregivers that I work with is use this breath 
take that breath before you set the agenda. In fact, do it before any difficult conversation, caregiving or otherwise. I encourage every listener to practice this, but it can be really helpful. The other thing I want to just acknowledge is while it can be so very scary to open these conversations, so often patients and caregivers walk around in what I call a network of silence. Mm -hmm. Caregivers are avoiding talking about something because they don't want to upset the loved one. The patient is avoiding talking about the exact same thing because they don't want to upset the caregiver. And they're both avoiding it and they're isolating one another. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is so scary to bring that elephant in the room to open that conversation. But once you do, you're going to take an exhale and likely you're going to realize your care partner or patient has had this on their mind in some capacity. And by the way, when we open a conversation, we give permission to the other person to talk about it. So not talking about something sends the message that we are not allowed or supposed to talk about it. Well, how, once you've had the conversation, I think we un understandably like over dramatize how awful it's going to be. And you have the conversation, you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. You know, for example, you were talking about like people don't like to talk about death. Um, we have a very large group of, of community residents that hang out at the dog park a certain hour of the day. And one gal recently lost her mom. And now I've noticed that we're all talking about what we want done with our remains when we're gone. You know, and I'm a little surprised at the number of people that still they want to be cremated. I didn't think that that was as popular a choice. And we've actually talked about human composted. And I'm like, this is not a conversation I would have had four years ago, I don't think. So it's it's changing, but it's, you know, I think the death of her mom opened up that possibility. Let's say we're already talking about it. So here, let's talk about some more stuff. And you've had this conversation. You're not running around trying to figure out like, well, what did dad want? Or, you know, am I doing the right thing? Is that, you know, it's like, you're not constantly second guessing yourself. Cause I think that's really, really common with caregivers. We, we want to do the best job we can for our loved one, regardless if they're a parent, grandparent, spouse, whatever. And just that constant questioning of if you're doing the right thing, are you doing enough? is just awful. It's definitely not good emotionally. And if when you have these conversations, you can alleviate a little bit of that just because you at least have a clue. Like I knew my dad didn't want to go back on dialysis. I had to keep telling all the doctors at the hospitals, I don't know why you're doing dialysis. It's not what he wants. We're going home on hospice. Why are we on dialysis? Um, so I needed to learn how to advocate a little better. But, you know, it's just once you once you know then you have more. I feel like you have a little bit more authority. You can say, I know my dad didn't want dialysis. We can stop doing that exactly. versus, well, am I killing him or am I making the wrong choice? Like the 500 questions that go through your brain. You know, the other suggestion I have for you, and this is of course with their permission, but if you've, if you've opened this conversation about advanced care planning and goals of care and what care they want and that sort of thing, you might also ask for their permission to record the conversation, either audio record or even just video record. I had audio recorded a conversation my dad and I had in January of 2019, the month before he died, um, which was really helpful for me um, during his last days to listen back on, to remind me that the decisions that I was making were in line with his goals of care. And I think that often, you know, you said, you know, hindsight's 2020, but it can be really helpful for us as caregivers when we step into that healthcare proxy role and we do have the responsibility to, to share a voice on behalf of another to listen to that voice again. And so again, obviously this depends on your care partner's willingness, but if they're willing, I, I do strongly encourage you to actually have these conversations recorded. I, I can imagine that that was definitely, soothing is not the right word, but reassuring. Like, it, was you reassuring. Knew you it was reassuring because um, it told me that the choices I made during my dad's last week were in line with what he had told me he wanted just a month earlier just important it's hard enough when you lose a parent but then to question everything you did is just it's exactly. not productive <laughs> exactly but it is how our brains work which i'm sure you you know better than me is there any last tip you would like to leave the listeners with before we let you run off and as we were discussing before we hit record both of us have like 500 things to do today <laughs> Well, 500 things to do but always most important is getting to speak to caregivers so it's a it's an honor to be here um, you know, something I, 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 I always like to end with is the fact that none of us should do this alone. 
And the reality is I know that some of you probably are rolling your eyes and are saying, well, I'm the only person available. And I get that. I was a primary caregiver. My mother died very suddenly a year after my dad's diagnosis, and I was left to take care of him. But the reality is that we can delegate. We can ask for help. And by, you know, not doing it alone, I both mean and literally having other people help out, even if it's in small ways, keep a running list of the tasks you need to take care of so that the next time somebody says, hey, Allison, I'd love to help you out. And I can say, oh, great. Let me open my notebook and tell you about <laughs> the things that I have, because there are things I need help with. Right. Always delegate. By the way, if someone offers help, always say yes immediately. And if you don't know what else to say, you say yes. And I don't know exactly right now, but I'm going to get back to you and let you know what I need help with. So I want you all to delegate. I want you all to ask for help. And I want you all to find support. You know, while the program at Memorial Sun Kettering was the first of its kind and, and it's still, you know, we're trying to grow the model. There is a lot of support out there for caregivers, both professional and peer support and group support. And I think it's really important to realize that you are not alone in this. You don't have to recreate the wheel, which I feel like almost all caregivers end up having to do. I'm not really sure why. Once we figure that out, we're going to really be supportive of caregivers. And I'm going to add to your have a list of all the tasks you need to have done. This is something I, I talk about frequently. In addition to that list, list of things to do, make a list of everybody you know and what you think they're best suited for. So when Allison says, hey, Jen, what can I do to help? I've already thought through that you're going to be good at X, Y, and Z, but probably terrible about A and B. Like, yeah, don't oh, ask me that. to talk. Don't ask yeah. me to talk to insurance companies. It stresses me out just thinking about it. You need yeah, food, dog walk. Yeah, it's something I learned from another podcaster whose family took care of his grandmother, and then her sister got Alzheimer's as well. She had never married or had children, and they essentially had what they called the care committee, and they. They literally had like little board meetings. It was it was very intense. Um, they're a family that demonstrates how to do it right. But I am fully aware that most of us are not in a family like that. You don't sound like you were. I definitely wasn't. And so I've remixed it, so to speak, to make it easier for the general caregiver. You know, if you don't have cousins and siblings and parents and aunts that are helping how do you manage to do this and so when allison says hey what can i do you have an answer and if you don't i like what you said fantastic so the name of your book is stand by me what was the subheading stand by me a guide to navigating modern meaningful caregiving and and it's a, you know to not reinvent the wheel i've really tried to provide a lot of guidance so that, that we don't have to start from scratch well it definitely sounds like after listening to this conversation that i'm part of Definitely sounds like everybody should grab the book and regular listeners know that the book is hot linked in the show notes. Just scroll down, hit it. It'll take you right to whatever website to purchase it. And you can, you can grab it as soon as we're done here and get started on getting, getting to a better place in your caregiving journey. So I want to thank Allison for writing the book and for coming on the show. I know there's like two other topics we could talk about if she's got time someday in the future. Happily, happy, happy to come back anytime. Thank you so much for having me, truly. You're, wel you're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.